I love it, I love it. It is so awesome to see how much the product community has grown. One of the things I always talk about is uh, product leaders are the new general managers of businesses, and so we're gonna dictate the future of the economy, so very, very excited to see this group growing. Okay, uh, so uh, the topic I am very excited to share with you today is something I have thought long and deeply about, which is how do you maintain product innovation as you scale? It's actually a really, really hard thing to do, um, and I something I obsess quite deeply about as uh, Amplitude CEO, um, and I'm, we're just fanatical about, frankly. So I wanted to share a bunch of the lessons uh, about how we think about how do you drive innovation, particularly as you're going, growing and going to scale. Um, now you might say, hey Spencer, like innovation, that sounds like a ton of work. Man, do we really have to do that? Yes, yes you do. The companies that do not uh, innovate die, and the best companies, like some of the logos that you see up here, like Under Armour and Dropbox and NBC, uh, they have been able to continue to adapt uh, who they are and the products and services they deliver to win uh, because customers are expecting the latest and greatest and in order to keep up what they do, they need to continue to innovate. Uh, the moment you stop innovating, you are going to be disrupted. So I, I kind of took a look at a bunch of different categories. Uh, this is actually a slide from our uh, one of our fundraising decks where we talked about how digital products are the future. And, you know, as you see, uh, economies have changed. Uh, what, whatever vertical you're in, whether you're in media, uh, you know, you go from Blockbuster to Netflix, uh, whether you are in travel, uh, you go to calling an agent on the phone to online booking, whether you're in financial services, uh, whether you're in B2B, like kind of the list goes on and on and on. The companies that innovate will beat out and win over those who do not. So you, the best way to deal with that is disrupting yourself and out innovating uh, and making sure you're the, you're the one disrupting yourself versus someone else. Uh, so this is actually uh, part of the reason I'm excited to share this is that Amplitude was actually born out of self-disruption uh, and uh, yeah, internal disruption and innovation. So before Amplitude, we had this company called Sonalite, which was a voice recognition app. Uh, it was like a version of Siri for Android phones where you could talk to your Android phone and it would talk back to you. Uh, one of the core problems that we had was we really wanted to understand what our users were doing. So we ended up building our own analytics tools. Um, and after Stonelight didn't work out, we saw so many companies out there who wanted that same understanding of what their customers were up to, what led to long-term engagement or retention, what their best customers have in common. Um, and so we said, hey, okay, great. Let's go ahead and uh, build a product that does that. Um, we are actually still, so that was back in 2012, 12 years later in 2024, we are still being very aggressive about how we disrupt ourselves today. Uh, we just launched uh, last month Amplitude Easy, which was we rebuilt our platform from the ground up, the navigation, the UI, the sign-up process, the onboarding, what you got right out of the box. We changed our implementation from hundreds of lines of code to a single line of code um, and a ton more because, you know, we realized, hey, if we don't do that, someone else is going to do that to us. Uh, today, we're going to actually, I'm going to share with you guys in a little bit our launch of Amplitude Web Experimentation, which is a WYSIWYG editor, which I'm really excited so we're continuing to be really aggressive uh, about innovating and, and disrupting ourselves. Um, and you know, like I said, it's something that I think about uh, even to this day. All right, so let me talk to you really quickly about, sounds pretty straightforward, hey, who doesn't want to be innovative as you scale? What is the core problem? The core problem is this. Most people think that as you scale, as an organization, the output grows linearly, right? So you have more engineers, more product managers, more people working on creating innovative solutions, stuff goes up and to the right, amazing, really exciting. Or sorry, up and this is, this is your guys' right, okay, up and to the right. Um, uh, what actually I see happening to most companies who get to scale is you get something like this. The reality is the output of the team actually goes down uh, as you add more people. And there's lots and lots of reasons uh, that, that that is. There's, there's more complexity, there's more opinions, ownership gets diluted, people have less context, 
Um, things take longer to decide. Um, and so the average SaaS company that I talked to actually they were more innovative when they were a smaller team when they were a larger one, which is crazy. It's like, okay, why do we even bother to grow the team if this is the case? Um, what I've come to realize is what you want to be, if you do this right, what you can and are able to drive uh, is something more like this. So not quite linear, but hey, we're still innovating more as we grow. Um, so innovation is increasing and we're getting the benefits of scale uh, and being able to grow. So uh, what I'm gonna share with you today is uh, how do you get there? So I've thought long and hard about this, and there's three big things that I want to share with you on how do you keep up the innovation as you scale and grow. Uh, so the three things are, first, how you structure and manage your team. Second, making sure to be very deliberate around prioritizing the customer. And then third, how you embed innovation culturally so that the organization and the team gets the message that you constantly need to be innovating and disrupting yourself. Uh, so let's go ahead and go into them. Uh, okay, structure the organization. This may sound very tactical, but this is actually fundamental. Um, one of the, the best things about the importance of this is, is the idea that you ship your organizational chart. So if you're structured in the, the wrong way, it's gonna be very difficult for you uh, to, to, to be able to drive innovation because the people and how they're set up and their incentives are not gonna be done in the right way. Um, so first you need uh, the right team structure and organization. The key thing here is you need functional experts who own every single part of the delivery of a part of the product experience end to end. So that's the metrics uh, that output them. That's the tactics used to achieve those metrics. That's the specific things you're shipping this quarter. That's what you're planning to do next quarter. Um, that's, okay, all part of the same group of individuals and teams. One of the biggest mistakes I see companies make as they get to scale is they start to specialize and outsource this. So let's say, hey, we're gonna create a product operations team and they're responsible for thinking through the metrics and you know, if we're the governance or the CDP team or the growth team, we don't think through our own metrics, that's some other team. Or you know, we don't talk to the customers who use it, that's in a product or design research team. Or uh, we're gonna give, um, uh, we're gonna give you know, uh, control of the long-term roadmap to some other team. It's like, no, no, no. That entire thing, functionally end-to-end, -end, needs to be represented by a single team. Um, we actually ran into this problem a number of times as we scaled at Amplitude because a organizational structure that worked when we were smaller broke as we got to larger scale where it didn't make sense to you know, we ended up having to break out the governance and the data platform and the CDP teams because those were all focused on different personas and different user journeys, and we had them all melded into one. Um, and the job of leaders and executives is to be constantly thinking through this all the time. The shape of the innovation is not static, and so the shape of the organization needs to constantly evolve with what you're hearing from the market, with what it is you're trying, where you're trying to innovate, uh, with where you're trying to grow. So we're, we're, we constantly reevaluate these. We're going through that right now as we look at what we're gonna do for, for 2025. Uh, you know, we make changes here every six months. And a lot of teams are like, wow, that's super disruptive. How am I supposed to focus on shipping and getting stuff done if the surface area of what I'm working is constantly changing? Well, that is part of being an innovative company. You need to because the market is and your customers are expecting you to. And if you don't do it, someone else will. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the first thing I wanted to start off with, uh, which is the, the org structure kind of underlies everything. All right, uh, let me go to the second lesson uh, that I have on structure. Um, one of the biggest traps I see companies fall into as they get to large scale is they use the same process everywhere. Um, so once you get to, as an example, I'm in the B2B space, and as, as we get to 100 million ARR, one of the things you wanna do is you wanna be able to create new pieces of innovation that are separate from your core product. One of the hardest things uh, for, for us to make the adjustment to was the realization that the organizational structure um, for a new innovative team was actually very fundamentally different. So you're not gonna do quarterly planning for a new innovative team because you don't even know what's gonna happen two weeks from now, never mind next quarter or next year. Um, whereas an existing mature product, 
Like we had, we're an analytics company, and so our existing analytics product, that does need quarterly and annual planning because you have thousands of customers already and they need to know what to expect. Um, and you're not looking to make massive disruptions in that. And so separating, um, separating these two groups with their own processes, their own systems, their own cadences. Uh, let me give you a few examples. When we first were building our, our, our first new product beyond analytics at Amplitude, one of the things we did was we explicitly took them out of all of the existing planning processes that we had. So we didn't have them in the regular staff meetings, we didn't have them in our quarterly reviews, we didn't set quarterly goals for them. Instead, what we did is we had a much smaller group with them meet with them every two weeks, and we just focused on the single thing we cared about, which is new customer adoption of their product. So every, every two weeks, I'd meet with, this, with the experiment team, and I'd say, okay, how many customers do you have using it this week? You know, and then they'd say, hey, we have 20. I'm like, great, what do we need to do to get from 20 to 30? And then the next week, I'd come back and repeat the same thing. Okay, we're now at 30. How, many, uh, how do we get to 40 customers? And so on. And that was the single thing I focused on. And so all the existing process uh, that we had uh, for, our, for our large mature analytics product just was not appropriate. And so being able to create these smaller teams of innovation is, is fundamentally different. Um, and, and you have to create a bubble for them. Um, yeah, one of the other things that I'll, I'll tell you guys a funny story. One of the other things that happened is um, whenever you're creating a new innovative product within a company, a lot of people are very interested in hearing about what's going on with the product. And you can spend a lot of time, you know, the go-to-market teams want to talk to them, the sales teams wants to talk to them, the partnerships team wants to talk to them, like everyone wants to, uh, a piece of the innovative action. And one of the really key things is we said, okay, hey, no one gets to talk to this team except at this meeting every two weeks. So if you guys want to pitch them something or get them involved with some launch or something like that, you have to come to this meeting, and other than that, they're insulated so they can focus on just building and shipping really, really quickly because they're in a new space. Because their plans are constantly evolving. They don't know what, you know, what their product positioning is going to be. They don't know how this is going to work with partners. They don't know even how it's going to be sold to customers. Um, and so that was, that was a kind of really key aspect of it. So anyway, I, I think just, again, like when you're trying to do something new and innovative, insulating that rest of the team from a lot of your existing large larger company processes which are appropriate for a mature product. Okay, uh, last thing is uh, I want to talk about is the role of the product team. You know, a lot of people ask, hey, what's the role of product? You know, it's, it's a newer role that hasn't existed. Um, you know, how do we think about what it's responsible for? I think one of the most important things um, that I just alluded to is that a lot of products' job is to be the interface to the rest of the organization so that the core team can continue to focus on being aggressive uh, in shipping. So, um, yeah, I, all right, I already told you guys the story on this one. All right, I don't need to repeat it. Cool. Okay, all right, so that's the first point. Org structure matters a ton. All right, uh, second thing I wanted to get across to all of you about how do you keep up innovation as you scale is prioritize the customer always. Um, one of the core challenges you have when you're a mature organization and mature product where you have thousands or millions of customers using you is that there are all sorts of places that feedback on what you should be doing can come from. So uh, that can come from uh, you know, the field uh, and the salespeople, that can come from marketing, that can come from um, partners that you have, that can come from investors or your board, that can, there can be all sorts of input over here. Here's what you should do next on product. One of the things that we were very, very deliberate in always doing at Amplitude is keeping customer input as the North Star. And what that meant is that, hey, if we listen to customers and we focus on just building what they ask for, it is hard to go wrong with that. Um, and so one of the things I would do is every single meeting with, the, with our product teams that I'd have, whenever they proposed building something or they had some idea, my first question was always, what customers are going to want to use this? And I said this so much so that they got tired of hearing it and they put my face on a t-shirt with it and they just said, okay, Spencer, we don't even need you to come to these meetings. We can just use this t-shirt, put it on a chair, and have that represent you in the room instead. Uh, but to me... I think the part that was so valuable about it 
valuable about it is that the product team got the message of like, okay, we got to identify not just, hey, we think a lot of customers could use this. Let's actually talk about who specifically and why they're so excited and what is it that, that, that can, that's convinced them that this is more valuable than anything else. Um, and so, so I, I kind of think about this as a North Star for innovation is your customers are already living in the future they want to be living in. They're, they've kind of, they, they, they have something they aspire to want to be and they'll constantly be giving you feedback about ways that your product and your experience is not living up to that aspiration. And so if you just focused on continually being aggressive about delivering against that, uh, you, that's a really great North Star, and then eventually you'll go and build into that future. So, uh, so many of our great feature launches has been a direct result of customer feedback. We don't, like, we're very, very diligent about not shipping anything without identifying a specific customer or set of customers that we know are going to use it right off the bat. And so this is, this is just so core to the Amplitude DNA, and it's a big part of what has allowed us to become the leader in the analytics category and the leader in the space is just continually beating this drum. All right, um, so how do you actually do this? How do you know whether a customer is going to use it? Well, I'd say there's two big ways. First, talk to them. Number one thing you can do. Um, I see one of the bars that we have for our product management team is that you should be talking to customers 50% of the time. 50% of the time. So if you have 40 hours in a week, you better be spending 20 of those hours talking to customers in one form or another. And that's a really high bar. We have sometimes product managers who come from other orgs that's like, oh, well, that's the research department's job. Or, you know, I'll talk to a customer once a week. or I'll do it during launch. It's like, no, your, your role is to be doing that all the time. Because if you're not doing that all the time, how are you possibly going to understand the pain and what's needed? Um, the second thing, um, the second way we see companies doing this um, is uh, by looking at product data. So uh, you actually look at and observe people using your product. Now, you know, you can use Amplitude's product. There's a lot of other uh, great competitors of ours as well here. You know, I'm not religious about it. Um, but so feel free to use anyone. But my point is like you can actually get a lot of value by actually seeing uh, what people like, where they're having problems, where they're dropping off, what keeps them coming back, what the best users have in common. There's so much that, like it's, it's crazy to me how early the, this, this space is in that everyone I talk to agrees theoretically, hey, we should look at what our customers use to understand what our users value. Uh, but so few teams do it in practice. We're in the very early days of this, and I see the companies that are able to leverage it uh, be way more successful than everyone else. So that's the other way. In addition, once you've got the talking to users down, once you've got that muscle going, you know, there's ways, look at, look at what they do, look at the data, look at what they do at scale. Uh, the results can actually be quite surprising. I'll give you guys one quick story on this, is uh, DoorDash actually figured out that on-time delivery was the best predictor of repeat customer visits. So if you ordered from DoorDash and your delivery was on time, you were much more likely to order again than if your delivery was late or the time, the time estimate wasn't accurate. And this was actually a really key insight on their part. This is a big part. That kind of understanding from looking at the customer data is a big part of what has made them the dominant food delivery company in the US if you look at com versus companies like Uber Eats or Postmates or Grubhub or a bunch of their competitors who didn't look at the data and didn't have this understanding. They would focus on other things like shorter delivery times, um, but because DoorDash looked at the data, they realized that people are okay with longer delivery times as long as you're accurate about the estimates. Um, so again, shows uh, a lot of the value in terms of understanding your customers, understanding them by talking to them, understanding them by looking at the data. Okay, let's get to the last part, culture. Okay, so you set up your organizational structure, fantastic. You're, you're using customers as your North Star, great. Um, that is not enough. Uh, the last bit is you want to be deliberate about embedding innovation uh, into your culture. And I'm not just talking about the folks in this room here uh, who are part of product and engineering teams. I'm talking about how do you drive this into your entire company. Um, one of the key mantras that we have is we want our teams to be very, very aggressive about how they, ex how they experiment. So we want them to be trying out new things all the time. And we expect a very high failure rate. Um, one of, the, th one of the, the reasons that we're very deliberate about that is what happens as you get to scale is 
a lot of organizations can be very afraid to share bad news. Hey, this new, exper this, this new feature we launched didn't work out. Or, hey, this new uh, thing that we tried with our customers didn't work in the way we expected to, even though, even though we put a lot of work into it. Um, and so you, you, want it, you want to set a culture where, hey, it's OK to fail. The important thing is if you, if you went, moved fast on it and you learned something from it. And so we're very deliberate in constantly experimenting with things, killing things that don't work, focusing on things that do. Um, the other thing. Um, that we do uh, on the in, in terms of embedding innovation in the culture is be very deliberate about creating rituals across the organization. So two that I want to share with you here is one is the first is at our all hands every week we will do a product demo of something new, and that's a huge deal because it kind of sends the message to the entire company that we're always delivering something new and we always expect. Uh, the product to get better over time, and we always want to kind of push the envelope of who we are. Um, and it's an exciting moment, you know, for an engineer or product manager or designer to get up there in front of the company and share what it is they've built and what it is they're working on. The second thing uh, that we do is we have a feature releases channel on Slack where our product development team will post about new features and stuff is full there uh, every single day of the week. It's actually one of the great sales tools I use because whenever I uh, am talking with a potential customer of Amplitudes, I kind of show them, hey, look, you know, here's an example of the stuff that we've gotten out there in the last week. And the key on that is like anyone can post in it. It doesn't need to go through some long review process before, you know, hey, we got to train support and we got to write documentation. It's like, hey, you can just post whenever you've created something new and just get it out there right away. Um, and so that helps uh, a lot as well. Um, okay, uh, last thing, I, I want to do a quick plug. Uh, we just launched Amplitude, just as part of the culture of innovation, we just launched our web experimentation product today. So this is a WYSIWYG editor. Um, one of the great things about this is, one of the trends we're seeing is that it's important to give innovation to non-technical teams as well. And so how do you let your marketing team, or how do you let folks who don't know how to code be able to actually make changes and ship stuff? So in that spirit, in that vein, one of the things that we just that we're announcing today is uh, a WYSIWYG web experimentation editor. So anyway, go ahead, check that out on our site. Um, and like I said, I'm not religious about it, so feel free to use any product. My point is, uh, these are all just great ways to embed innovation across your company. All right, so uh, to wrap up, uh, let me ask one question. Who here cares about innovation? Hell yeah, all right, we gotta see more hands going up for that. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, Problem I've thought uh, quite a bit about. Uh, first, think about team structure because you end up shipping your org chart and that is the biggest lever that you have to create an innovative culture. Second, uh, put your customer first. Think about what customers are actually going to use our product. And third, create rituals that embed innovation throughout your, uh, throughout your culture. Um, it requires a lot of focus, but if you're able to do that, you're able to scale uh, innovation successfully and go and win. Uh, and be the, the next world uh, dominating company. So I am Spencer Skates. Thank you all very much for listening to my talk. Thank you guys.